Hey everyone, the goal of this video will be to cover the last few examples in lecture 13 that we didn't get a chance to cover in lecture. So I'll start with the pets example, even though we covered a little bit of this in class. Uh, so we're told that we have 12 pets, five dogs and seven cats. How many ways can we select four of our pets? And we'll assume that here order doesn't matter. And so this question is pretty straightforward. We can uh, use the combinations idea pretty directly. We have 12 pets in total, and we want the number of ways that we can select four of them. Now here, we're not really thinking about whether they're a dog or a cat. We're just saying, okay, I have all of my pets. I have 12 of them. I want to select four. Uh, and that can be done in 12 choose four ways. Because remember, n choose k is the number of ways to select k elements from a group of n such that you're selecting them without replacement and order does not matter, which matches exactly what we're looking for here. Part two is where things get a little more interesting. So now we're in the first question, we're asking how many ways can we select four pets such that we end up with two dogs and two cats? So what I wanna do is first look at the number of ways I can pick my two dogs. And so I know I have five dogs in total, and I want to pick two of them. The number of ways that can be done in is five choose two. Then now let's just look at the cats individually. I have seven cats, and I want to pick two of them. How many ways can that be done? Well, that can be done in seven choose two ways. Now, since I have to pick two dogs and two cats, I need to multiply the number of ways I can select my two dogs by the number of ways I can select my two cats. And so the result is you know, attained by multiplying these two numbers. Five choose two times seven choose two. Let's continue. The second part is asking us, how many ways can I select four pets such that I have three dogs and one cat? Well, we can use the same principle. First, let's look at my dogs. I have five of them and I want to select three. So that can be done in five, choose three ways. And for my cats, well, I have seven of them and I want to choose one of them. That can be done in seven, choose one ways. Note that seven, choose one is just seven. Okay, and uh, based off of what we just discussed, I'm multiplying five, choose three by seven, choose one to get the total number of ways of selecting three dogs and one cat. Okay, now let's look at the third part um, where we're asked to determine the number of ways I can select four pets such that I have at least two dogs. Now note here that there are four options for the number of dogs that I could end up selecting. I could select none, which would mean I would select all cats. I could select one dog or two dogs or three dogs or four dogs uh, because we're selecting only four pets in total. So here I want the number of ways to select at least two dogs. Well, selecting at least two dogs is equivalent to selecting two dogs or three dogs or four dogs. But when I select two dogs, I also select two cats. When I select three dogs, I also select one cat, right? Because the total number of pets that I'm selecting is four. So if I select k dogs, I must select four minus k cats. Uh, and so if I select all dogs, well, then I'll have no cats. Okay, so we've already computed two of these three cases individually, right? We computed that the number of ways to select two dogs and two cats is five choose two times seven choose two. And the number of ways to pick three dogs and one cat, well, that's just five choose three times seven choose one. In the last case, where I'm choosing four dogs and no cats, well, that can be done in, let me make some space here. That can be done in five choose four times seven choose zero ways. Right? And this really just boils down to five choose four because anything choose zero is just equal to one. Right, because if I'm not picking any cats, well, then it really just boils down to how many ways can I pick uh, my four dogs. 
And so since there is an or between all three of these cases, I'm picking two dogs or three dogs or four dogs, I need to add together the number of combinations in each of these three cases. So this result is the number of ways that we can select four pets such that we have at least two dogs. This is what the question is asking for. And this uh, used two sort of counting principles at once. We multiplied because we had and, right? Like two dogs and two cats. And then we added because we had ors, right? Two dogs or three dogs or four dogs. Great. So now the third part of this question is asking, suppose we randomly select four of our pets, what's the probability that we selected at least two dogs? Well, it turns out that we actually did most of the work for this question already, but uh, we'll still be rigorous here. So when we're working on a probability problem, it's a good idea to define what our sample space is. And here I'll say our sample space is the set of all combinations of four pets. So here, the probability of having at least two dogs is the number of combinations of four pets. And my numerator is the number of combinations of four pets with at least two dogs. What's my denominator? Well, we already calculated that at the start of this video. That's 12 choose four, just the total number of ways to select four of my pets. That's 12 choose four. The numerator, the number of combinations of four pets with at least two dogs, that's what we just calculated here, right? So that's five choose two, seven choose two, plus five choose three, seven choose one, plus five choose four, seven choose zero. So this is the probability the question was asking for. And note that we were only able to use this sort of uh, successes divided by total framework because all combinations of four pets were equally likely. If they weren't all equally likely, we would have to do something a little more complicated. But since you know we're randomly selecting our four pets, all combinations of four pets are equally likely. Okay, so let's move on. Now we're being told that we we're flipping a fair coin 10 times. And what's a fair coin? Well, uh, it's a little thick. A fair coin is one where the probability of heads is the probability of tails. Both of these are a half. And each flip is independent of other flips, meaning what I get on my first flip has no impact of what I'll get on my second flip and so on and so forth. So the first part is asking, what's the probability that we see the specific sequence THTT, HTH, HTH? Well, like I just said, each of the flips are independent of one another. So what I can do is use the multiplication rule to just look at the probabilities of these individual flips, right? I have 10 individual flips. I can look at the probability of each of those happening and then I can multiply them all together because all of the flips are independent. So what's the probability that I flip the coin once and my fr the, you know, what I see is a tail? Well, that's a half. What's the probability that I flip it again and I see a head? And the reason I'm thinking about heads is because that's the second thing in the sequence. Well, that's a half. What's the probability that I flip it again and see a tail? Well, that's a half. And so on and so forth. Since this coin is fair, the probability of seeing a head and of seeing a tail is going to be the same, they're all a half. So I'm gonna multiply a half by itself 10 times, and so this probability is going to be one half to the power of 10. Now let's look at the second part. We're being asked, what is the probability that we see an equal number of heads and tails? Now, in this particular sequence, there happened to be an equal number of heads and tails, right? There were one, two, three, four, five heads, and so there were also five tails. But this is not the only sequence with an equal number of heads and tails. Right? What if we instead saw H, 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 T, 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 H, T? That is also a sequence 
of 10 coin flips with an equal number of heads and tails. And so we need to account for the total number of ways that we can flip a coin 10 times and see five heads and five tails. Okay, so we need to first determine number of ways to flip coin and see five heads and five tails. Let's work on that. So one way to think about it is that we have 10 positions, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, and I need to fill these with five heads and five tails. You can actually think of this as a combinations problem, right, where I have 10 positions, I'm going to choose five of them to be occupied by heads, or equivalently, I'm going to choose five of them to be occupied by tails. Whichever way you think about it, it turns out that there's 10 choose five ways to arrange five heads and five tails amongst each other. If you want to look at this concretely, like my positions are 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. If I choose five of these randomly, you know, maybe I'll get 2, 3, 7, 8, 9. Well, that's saying 2, 3, I have four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. These flips are heads, and everything else needs to be a tail. So one, four, five, six, and ten would be tails. So I have you know a set of ten positions. I choose five of them. I put heads at each of those positions, right? Two, three, seven, eight, nine, and the other five positions are automatically filled by tails. So there are ten choose five ways to rearrange five heads and five tails. Okay, great. Um, I'm going to erase this moment uh, just for a little bit. Um, so we know that there are 10 choose five ways to pick my five heads and five tails. And so now there are two ways to think about the problem and they both really get you to the same result. One thing we could do is say, is take the total number of sequences with five heads and five tails over the total number of sequences of 10 flips. Okay, the total number of sequences with five heads and five tails, well, we just talked about that, that's 10 choose five. Uh, and the total number of sequences of 10 flips, well, there are two options for the first flip, two options for the second flip, two options for the third flip, and so on and so forth. And so, as we looked at before, this is just n to the k, where n here is two, we have two options for each flip, and k is 10, because we're flipping it 10 times. So this is the probability that we see an equal number of heads and tails, but that's just one way to think about the problem. I wanna think about it another way uh, because this other way is going to help us in the last example question that we look at. So the other way to think about it is the probability of five heads and five tails is equal to the number of sequences with five heads and five tails times the probability of one particular such sequence. Right, so you can think of this as saying, well, first, let me figure out how many ways I can arrange these five heads and five tails. We already did that, that's 10 choose five. For each of those 10 choose five sequences, the probability of seeing that specific sequence is, you know, in this case, one half to the power of 10. So for all 10 choose five of my sequences, I'm adding together one half to the power of 10, right? Because it's one half to the power of 10 for one of those sequences, one half to the power of 10 for another, and so on and so forth, right? And so I can also think about this as being 10 choose five times this probability, which is one half to the power of 10. And so you see that these get you to the same result, but uh, it turns out that these interpretations are only the same because the coin was fair. Right? If the coin is not fair, you'd have to use this interpretation over here on the right because nothing about this interpretation on the right assumed uh, that the coin was fair. I mean, this probability calculation assumed that it was, but this strategy, what I've highlighted here, this did not assume that the coin was fair. Right? Whereas over here, we're assuming all uh, two to the 10 possible outcomes are equally likely when if the coin is not fair, they're not all equally likely. 
And so I keep talking about, you know, what would happen if the coin is not fair? And that's because that's what this last question is asking us about. So again, we'll start with a simpler example. Instead of thinking about, you know, all cases with five heads and five tails, we'll look at one specific sequence. So here I have the same sequence uh, and my coin flips heads with probability one third, which means it's tails with probability two thirds. And we're still assuming that uh, each flip is independent. So first I wanna find the probability that I see this specific sequence, T H T T H T H H T H. Well, let's work it out. What's the probability that the first flip I get is tails? Well, that's actually two thirds. What's the probability that the next flip I get is heads? Well, that's one third, right? So for every tail that I see here, I need to multiply by two thirds. And for every head here, I need to multiply by one third. Almost done. So this is the probability of this specific sequence under the assumption that the probability of flipping heads is one third. Now note that you can simplify this. It turns out that we wrote one third five times and two thirds also five times. And that's because in this sequence, I had five heads and five tails, right? Even though the coin is now biased, meaning it's not a fair coin, each flip was still independent. So all we really need to think about is the number of heads and the number of tails in our 10 flips. So this is the probability of this one specific sequence with five heads and five tails. But now part two is asking us for the probability that we see an equal number of heads and tails in general. So what's the probability that we see five heads and five tails, right? So using this principle from before, we can think of this as being the number of sequences with five heads and five tails multiplied by the probability of one sequence having five heads and five tails, right? Because, you know, there is some number of these sequences. Again, we know that it's still 10 choose five. And for each of those 10 choose five sequences, the probability of seeing that specific order of heads and tails is whatever we just calculated. One third to the five times two thirds to the five. So, like I said, there are still 10 choose five, you know, orderings of five heads and five tails, right? That alone, right? The number of ways to order my 10 flips such that there are five heads and five tails, that alone doesn't involve probability. Um, the probability comes in when we start to ask for, you know, what is the probability of X, Y, Z? Um, and here, since the coin is not fair, we know that this is the probability of one specific sequence. And so I can multiply by this, which is one third to the five, two thirds to the five. And so this is the probability that the question is looking for. The probability that we see an equal number of heads and tails is 10 shoes five times one third to the five times two thirds to the five. So I'll write that here. Probability five heads, five tails is 10 shoes five, one third to the five, two thirds to the five. Okay. This comes from looking at one specific sequence This comes from looking at the number of sequences that are relevant. So the number of sequences with five heads and five tails. And so something I encourage you to do is think about how this result would change if we were instead looking for the probability of seeing say six heads and four tails or nine heads and one tail. And you can see that uh, you just have to change these numbers a little bit to account for, you know, if you're looking at a different number of heads and tails. Okay, that's basically it. Uh, let me know on Campus Wire or in Office Hours if any of that was confusing, uh, and then we can take a look. Okay, thanks for watching.